Hello everyone, thanks for having us and me. I'll, I'll begin. Um, we're all going to share um, our thoughts, our work and um, our thoughts about our collaboration. So I'm going to go first. My name is Najia Baji and I am an artist working in collaboration with Jenny, Jem and Rebecca and loving it. So I'm going to start to share my presentation here. And hopefully this will work. Okay, so that's my name, Nijay Baji, and um, in the top right hand corner of this uh, slide is one of the works that was shown actually in Karn. So some of um, what I wanted to talk about today is where this work came from and then talk about what's actually showing in Elysium as well. So this work here that you can see is um, actually a GIF. So when it's running on the screen, it runs quite quickly. I don't know if, um, if you're all familiar or if you use GIFs, they're kind of like looped image, films made of still images. And so they, they can be quite jarring. Um, and yeah, that's just a little extra. And this is the GIF. So hopefully when I press play, you might be able to see. Yeah, good. So I'm going to talk about this while it's going. We'll all be distracted by the fact that it's going. Oh, it's stopped. That's good. Um, so I loved you, but you loved her. Um, came from some explorations I was doing right at the beginning of this work. Um, I was thinking a lot about absence, as I often do. The image that you can see here um, underneath the image that's layered on top of the image, that, which is layered on top of text, is a um, is part of a bridge and it's graffiti scrubbed out. So the the remnants of what was. So there were lots of I found it really um, intriguing to think about what people might have written there and how permanent those those feelings or thoughts might have been at one point and then how beautiful the remnants were when you scrubbed it out. Um, and along with some other thoughts about absence and remnants, I took it, I wanted to ask people for messages that they want, they, they never, they've never said, but they, they wanted to put out there into the world. So things that were silenced. Um, and the most moving, the one that resonated the most was a message that I received from somebody which was, I loved you, but you loved her. And so for me, it was like, this perfect way of talking about absence, maybe abandonment, and like those layers that I loved you, but you loved her to me, that said, a, I didn't know what the story was, but I could make it up and it was deep and it was rich and it was really powerful. Um, so I then took that motto, a phrase, and I used it in lots, lots of work. One of them being this gift. So another kind of um, inspiration between that I loved you, behind I loved you, but you loved her, was at the time I was looking into protests. So there were protests happening, the Black Lives, Black, Black Lives Matter movement was happening, um, and there were lots of protests on the street. And there were obviously lots of face coverings as well um, from through the pandemic. Um, this image here isn't mine, um, it's from Reuters. But it's an image of Libyan women um, protesting to be included in the um, the next government after after Gaddafi was overthrown in Libya and North Africa. And in order to show that they were being silenced, they covered their mouths. And so for me, this like mouth covering, not being able to say censorship, silence, um, and the message of "I loved you, but you loved her," were all the same thing. <laughs> So this is another um, two extracts and elements of work, actually. Um, on the right hand side are in Khan, there was, and we'll see it in a minute, a piece of embroidery that, again, took the, the motto, I loved you, but you loved her, 
and I embroidered it with some quite bright colours onto fabric and then basically stopped when I felt that I wanted to stop and um, allowed it to be maybe a little bit of a performance. I come from a performance background and a music background. So when I felt like my body wanted to stop the movement of embroidery, I stopped. And these are the threads on the right hand side that came down from that. And if you look really closely underneath them, there is some gold uh, vinyl lettering. And that was really big along the wall of I loved you, but you loved her. And also it was in Welsh. Rebecca helped me with that. And on the left hand side is a some detail from a piece that is in Elysium called She Dances. And that piece, again, maybe is a performance when I, when I make it each time it's different and it's made of voile and um, copper wire. So it's a really about the movement for me, about making, about moving. And then kind of when it seems finished, when it feels finished, um, moving on from it. So um, yeah, maybe these two things I didn't realize were quite similar. And uh, maybe in colour and um, and movement, so I wanted to show them both to you together. So <clears throat> this is the piece that I was just talking to you about. I loved you, but you loved her. I L Y B Y L H pink, um, and you can see there that the material is really bright, um, and that I have just stopped. Um, for me, that was where my body wanted to stop. And also I think my, uh, my the physicality of making it was also representing like the absence, the message, the tone um, of something that's unsaid. Um, and that, that piece is, is in Elysium, so you can see it there. Um, and a detail of that piece. So you can see that it's quite carefully stitched up until the point where, um, ends so endings are definitely in the work and this is <clears throat> an image of she dances so just a couple of things about this the work itself so as you can see maybe hopefully there's a lot of movement in the work so you can maybe see where i've pulled it round and threaded it through <clears throat> tied you know fastened kind of made secure for me the material was really important because the voile and the color of the voile is quite vulnerable and um delicate and then the copper wire felt quite strong one of the i guess developments for me was i loved you but you loved her the work was quite um sad i suppose but maybe not sad but absent and and of endings and um, definitely reflective of the of the pandemic and then this this work in Elysium I, I think is more hopeful and has more movement has more like forward motion so there's there's she dances um a figure perhaps and then behind it is a work of gems um and uh the words you can see slide over the full phrases shadows slide over and that's an extract from a poem that I wrote called on hope which features in little fragments and um yeah i really like how all of these things we really like how they work together how the shadow of the the, the space is there as well and how the painting and the um the, the form speak to one another that was something we got really excited about because we could actually see each other and and and, and install together you know in elysium and and enjoy that uh, this is a detail of she dances just maybe showing you the movement, the threading, and the kind of um, different materials there. I'm probably coming towards my time. So I've just got two, maybe one or two slides left. <clears throat> this is another um, piece. Um, it's actually a video with sound. It's a short film, um, but that doesn't come across very well on Zoom. So do go go and see it or follow us on, if you're not already on Instagram and you can see some of it there. It's called Four Movement. And this came, it was a long time in the making. It started with me watching a tree, a solitary tree and sketching um, the shape of it to make a score, a graphic score. So then I used the shape of the tree to create a choral, a vocal score, composition. I then sang the base of that and asked a beautifully, wonderful 
a musician friend of mine to improvise over it. Um, she then did that, and then I went out and I filmed the the dance of many trees. Um, so there's like a slow mo film of trees, and layered, and then edited the film to follow the movement of of the sound. So hopefully, um, what you're watching. In my in my mind is, is a dance and it's from one solitary tree to many so again hope is coming i think and and reflective of bringing a bit further on in the pandemic yeah i think this is my last slide so i just wanted to show again the the and i know others are going to do the same the, the the talking the interaction of our work so on the left here is another piece by gem by gemma and um Closer to you on the right is uh, a piece by Rebecca, the beginning of a piece. Uh, you can see a label just underneath that is some work by Jenny, some beautiful work that she'll speak about. And then in front of you is the I loved you, but you loved her in pink and in gold. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> when you go, you'll be able to see the, the kind of conversation that those pieces are having with each other in the space. And that's it from me. So um, there I am, my website, if you want to go and see it. And I am, um, thank, thank you for your time. And I'm going to hand over to Jenny now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, OK, oh, actually, you've got to stop sharing, isn't it? OK, and I'll, uh, I will start. Thank you. Um, right. Okay, so, right, so that should be sharing now. Okay, so I'm going to briefly just chat about um, my work today. And just this first slide is just starting off to talk about some of the themes that have been um, and things I've been thinking about within my work. And that's been sort of across the two exhibitions that we've done. So independent time and personal rhythms, motherhood and the pandemic, inside and outside, beginning, middle and end, here, there and in between, planning for uncertainty, do it yourself, not making extra work for myself, utilising the moments of the everyday, finding time, notes made at 3.49am using my phone, using every opportunity to be creative, how to present in a space and bring liveness to a space when you're not able to physically be there. Not much room. And that's the title of the piece of work that I'm basically going to talk to you about today. And that's a piece of work that spans across like the both exhibitions that we've done so far and has really been like an evolving piece of work. So it started off in Cannes, in Carnavon. And Not Much Room basically manifested as my home printer being installed in the gallery space. It was installed about the height of my mouth. So they had some sort of physical um, physical resemblance in the space. And each day for a durational piece of work, I would, at some point in the day, I would write a text Basically, it's just like a simple reference to what I was up to at the time, and I'd arrange it creatively on the page, date and time it. And then using my phone, I'd connect remotely to the printer in the gallery space, and I would send it to print in the gallery. So the idea was basically it was creating a connection between this home, which I've been quite confined to in terms of like early motherhood and also like the pandemic, saying there's some quite similar aspects to that um that I found and I would send this to print and, and appear physically in the space in North Wales in the in the exhibition place when this was printed it would simply just fall to the floor and over the duration of like six weeks the works would gather and pile up on the floor and create a body of work and I suppose I saw this as a way of being able to like manifest these little snatches of moments of creativity throughout each day and create a body of work. So it's it's been these works that have formed uh carried like on to the second part within Elysium 
And so I chose to exhibit all of the visual, all of the printed texts in the exhibition. And there was 44 in total, I think, one for each day. So you can see here that some are been pinned up to the wall. This is the entrance to the exhibition. So they've been pinned really low down on the wall and they run along for about halfway for the length of the first wall. And I think like I've been thinking of these sort of texts in a way of being like also acting as like a score, which could be like an instruction for a movement or an action in a way to like re-perform these movements again. And not only are they individual works, but I guess in the way I've presented them as a whole it would be like trying to affect a movement in the viewer from who would come and look at the work. As in, you know, to look at these properly, you need to duck down really low and also like move along the wall. So here's the second instalment in the exhibition. And this runs from the main gallery space through the doorway and into the back room in the gallery three. I've, it's important to say actually that none of these are in date order. In the first part of the exhibition, they were all printed obviously in date order and would have piled up accordingly. But this time I chose to select them at random and pick out a random order to pin up. And I think it's really because of like this idea of time and these snatches of moments. And in a way by doing this, you're creating, I was looking to create like a, jumbled up sort of mishmash of time as well and I think there's sort of repetitions within some of the texts and subjects that also sort of accidentally reoccur because of this and this is an image of going to the back of the room so you can see here as well that the uh, texts here are much more at eye height but even if you're sort of following them along you're gonna like still affect a movement into the room I've used thumbtacks to pin them to the wall. And this is very much linking to this idea that I was very much, you know, in these sort of uncertain times that it was using like materials that we had to hand to present our works. And thumbtacks is something you'd have at home, perhaps for a pin board. And so it was easily, um, easy ways of producing work that I've been looking to produce. So this final image shows that because there was like a lot of printouts, um, some of them that didn't actually get pinned to the wall I put in a pile and these are placed on the floor so that people can actually just leaf through and look at these and I think as some of these pictures always already show is that um, not only does my work sort of talk amongst itself but it also talks amongst the work of the other artists and even just here you can see that these have been placed and they've been placed underneath and in front of a painting by Gemma that's titled us So I was just going to show now a couple of the sort of texts in detail so you get like an idea a bit more what they might look like up close. They were all referenced and dated in the same way each day, which was with a footnote and then the time and date. And then the sentences, as I'll read them out, relaxing with a cup of tea while the baby plays and catching up with emails. So, you know, they're very, you know, they're very linked to mundane day to day routines. And I think as well, it's worth noting that some are much more visually interesting than others. It would really just depend on the time of the day and how and how much space I had to think about it at the time. So the one on the left here is on my phone whilst breastfeeding. And I can remember when I made this, it was on my small phone and I lined up the letters with the letters on the keyboard. So you can see all the O's aligned, all the N's. So they sort of correlate in that way. And that's what's given them the, the spacing that they have here. And then the one on the right was at like two in the morning. And that was awake with a crying baby. So when I sort of said that I've also looked at these printed texts as like a score, as a way of sort of making uh, action or movement, um, I used, I selected nine quite at random from the whole body of work and used them to make a video work. And Awake with a Crying Baby is one that I used. So you can see here, this is a, a picture of the two screen installation, film installation that's in Elysium. And on the left there is a clip of the film 
the short film that was made using that score. And the films are positioned together to sort of create like a conversation. But what you can see is that actually some of the some time there isn't always action on the screen. And I think it really links back into these ways of the texts were produced that actually it, what I realised in Khan in the the way that the the texts were printed was that for this really short moment of liveness, there was actually a massive space of nothingness and absence, sort of. And so it sort of became that there was these absences were as equally as important as these moments of action for me. And so within this film, um, each time I recorded a response for the score, if I was using my camera, um, I would edit out the parts that I didn't want to use and keep the part that I did want to use, but the gaps, but the gaps were created by the parts that I wasn't using, which means each film has these blank bits and then the moment of action, which is a response to the score. This is a clip when two um, actions are corresponding at each time. And I made them, what's interesting as well, I think, is that when I was re-performing this like routine in a different way, again, I was picking like these in-between moments of the day-to-day. -day. I wasn't having like a set time to go off and record them. I was literally going off and, you know, perhaps when I had my shower, I'd quickly do my the, one of the responses. Um, my boyfriend's in the background there making dinner. Um, so I was really like snatching these moments again and using that time to refilm. So again, it's like compounding these, um, uh, these minutes and moments that are snatched and muddling them up again. I'm really like doing this massive reorganization. And so here's one final image, which shows uh, another snippet of a score on the right hand side. Um, basically there was each film is slightly different in length. One film is, I think about three minutes, 11 seconds, and the other film is three minutes, two seconds. And because of this differing time loop and then being placed together, the films continually change and th the films start different loops. So the moments of action start playing at different times and, we'll and then we'll start to shift and form like new routines throughout the day. So it's almost like a changing installation in the way the films will interact and relate to each other throughout the day. And again, I feel like that's a final sort of way of, again, mixing up and mashing up this, this time that I've been thinking about. So that's all for me. And now I'm gonna pass over swiftly to Bex. Thank you. Hey all thank you, Jenny. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and uh, share my screen and discuss a little bit about my practice and how and how the group really um, influenced my work. Um, oh, lovely! It's gone back to the uh, to the end, so I'm just going to flick through that. And then we'll get started. But um, so I know everyone um, as part of, uh, part of the project. Um, I know everyone various. Either I've worked with them before, or I've worked in a sort of a professional practice with them. And um, but I'd never, on a scale of four female artists working together, collaborating. And I think when we had our initial um, Zoom meeting after we knew we'd received the funding and we knew we had Karen and Elysium was backing us, um, I realised the whole process that I'd started to work with and I, my ideas, my original ideas, um, was going to be thrown out the window and, um, and that I really had to start afresh again due to the circumstances that we were all in, but also realising that this was really a collaboration, a collaboration of artists bouncing off each other through this digital um, digital uh, experience really um, 
we'd had hoped to kind of meet up um, and have those kind of physical um, uh, reactions with each other's work and, and with each other. Um, but under the circumstances, that didn't happen until until Elysium, actually, where we finally we were finally in one room together. Because even when we um, installed in Karen, um, there was uh, we weren't actually in the same space at the same time. Um, so yeah, so my work at the time, I kind of had knew exactly what I wanted to be doing, and then realised that not just uh, the influences of outside. Um, and uh, the collaboration process of just listening, um, you know, it could be a simple phrase or um, a method maybe another artist was using and it, uh, it you know, it, it just triggers something and, um, and then you start playing around. If you haven't seen our Instagram yet, please go and, um, and go and view it. It's um, men, at Menrong. And you can really see the process of the ideas. A lot of pieces that haven't actually been fulfilled and, and, and not been, ever been exhibited. So I always think that that process side is really exciting as and almost as much as the actual work itself. So um, so when I um, when I started my work, um, I was kind of influenced by purely form and movement and shadow, the whole process of the inside outside, the the balance between negative and positive, and here and now, and and obviously being that pressure of of you know we're, we're not only able to get to the studio, the studio had to become you know had to come home, and um, the influences that might have um, inspired you going to various galleries, you know none of that was happening, and I found influence from you know shadows from my daughter playing in a bucket outside on a summer's day or the lights that hit through the lamp in the conservatory that then flew on the wall and those kind of really simple movements of just the light at the end of the day in where I live in Gerland and Bethesda um, influenced my work uh, I tend to do a lot in installation and I found myself with my own room project. I was doing lots more photography, um, inspired to play around with video, um, but, all, but really on a, on a very kind of um, basic scale of, of just using my phone. Um, and, and yeah, so these, these two images I'm showing you now is really the basis start. So it kind of inspired me when I knew we were in car and I had to do something with the um, with the windows. I had to do something with natural light. That got, um, that golden hour in where I live with the sun in Gerlan and the orange and the colours that hit the walls. Um, I knew there was this, so I knew I had to have that kind of scale of time, but also and that, you know that fleeting moment that this will pass. You know, whenever you walked into the gallery, it didn't look like this all the time. It, you know, it would change um, as the hours went past. And I had three windows. I had this orange one, this pink one at the back that you've just seen when Jenny was showing her work, and um, a blue one, which was much higher, which everyone missed. And I love that idea of creating work that is so subtle, that is also, and once again, we keep repeating the words absent, but, um, but you know, you might not notice it. You might come back again and notice it. So my biggest um, challenge here, sorry, my brain is trying to talk Welsh to myself while I'm trying to translate into English and then a dyslexic brain as well. So just bear with me, guys, bear with me while I try and get these words out my my um, my head. Um, so I knew my biggest uh, challenge was there's no natural light in Elysium. Um, and how do I create this kind of not a complete copy but how do I create another piece of sculpture or installation that I feel um content with to exhibit and um and at the time prior to this I had wanted to work more kind of sculpturally but um but unfortunately due to the kind of the the, the pacing or the uh, the way it can have um uh created the space they've got a big wall that goes straight down the middle 
Um, it wasn't possible and I wanted to play around with underlay and very much simple kind of mundane materials. Um, so it wasn't until I got to Elysium, I got the chance to kind of um, explore and I knew I wanted this strong orange because it just been this really strong colour and um, moment during the whole period. I wanted to have this... Um, yeah, the colour within, and I know how difficult colour to work with as well, especially working with everyone else. So I kind of knew it was a bit dominant, but I kind of tried to balance it out with everyone else's work and um, and Jem and Naja and, and Jenny were being fantastic to let me kind of just carry on in that corner and explore these materials. But um, I kind of work very much, I might do drawings and I might try and figure things out, but it's actually not until I'm in the space and I'm playing, and I use the word play, um, with the materials and the configuration, the composition, that I finally kind of get a gut, gut instinct of when something's finished. But um, but it, it was the joy of just playing with the surroundings and allowing these pieces move on there because I wanted them to be floor and wall wall base which I didn't get that chance in Cannes so and I am waffling now but this so this is kind of an overview and I love the idea that this big strong orange that never moves was placed next to these kind of um video pieces that were constantly moving I, and there's this one where you saw earlier where Jenny had been she pulls back the shower curtain and I just feel like that's almost like she could be pulling back my underlay um, and that kind of that straight line, that kind of um, that repetitive straight line was in that piece as well. Um, and then I'm going to jump back. So I'm jumping a little bit. So I'm going to jump back to um, another piece that I did for Karen, um, which is a mixture of photography and vinyl. And, um, and so there's a there's, you know, cracked glass, window pane. There's, um, there's actually a, um, an image of uh, a monolith or kind of a really old rock uh, that is kind of the farmers try to kind of keep the piece together by putting some kind of lead or copper or something and then nailed it in to try and keep the crack together so it didn't fall apart. And then the bars um, that would happen from the stairwell on my... Um, I love the fact that I've literally just turned around to look at my stairs while I'm talking about it um, and how it looked like, you know, prison bars and, um, and this crack, which actually turns out to be kind of the Welsh border between England and Wales. And I can't, I couldn't, you know, during this period with Yes Cymru, it was just being influenced by what was else was going on instead of always looking internally into my work. I couldn't help but be externally influenced by um, matters and I didn't think it was a piece I was going to be bringing down to Elysium at all and then at the very very last minute um, I got I got it printed but I got it printed at half the size that it was in Karen and um, and once again while we it was, Elysium process was just such a pleasure because it was really where we could explore um, and experiment our work together and, and see those kind of um, talking relationships and I was just waiting for everyone to come in on a Friday morning. And I, the worst thing you could do was leave me alone in a, a gallery. Um, before anyone came in, I'd rearranged everything that we did on Thursday, um, uh, which was good because I think, yeah, it was, it was better. And I just saw this crack on the floor, a natural crack in the concrete. And, um, and it had to be done. It's, yeah, now that I'm talking about it, it sounds really cheesy. But uh, that fracture on the floor just had it had to be it had to be done. So um, luckily, everyone was happy that I put it on the floor. But uh, yeah, before anyone came in, I just started placing it. Um, yeah, I don't think I've got anything else to talk about that. And then I'm just going to say really quickly this last piece. So once again, as I was influenced by doing photography. And there's those fleeting moments that you wouldn't really grasp or, or you know, if we didn't have all that time, <laughs> I think I would have noticed it and I probably would have ignored it. And it's just my daughter playing and she's kind of in between adolescence and sort of seeing the effects of, of last year. And you can see how much she's grown 
had to grow up, if you get what I mean. And um, it was just this lovely, pleasurable moment where she was just once again just playing, creating shapes in the shadows. Um, and I didn't get to exhibit this in um, Karen. Um, and I kind of kept it in that kind of square social media format, really small. Um, so, you know, it's quiet, it's intimate. Um, and then I kind of, I'm not a poet, I, you know, as I said earlier, I'm dyslexic, words don't come easily. Um, and But I have felt like I had to write something. Um, and I'm going to finish with this because I'm bored of hearing my voice, um, which is what I wrote with it. And it says, Fel hiv galar, silwais ar de dyfiant, silwais bod galini ferch fach bron di gadael, bod caledwch y byd yn digipio, tra ti'n trio ffeindio dy ffordd, tra dan i gyd, adeg rhyfedd, adeg anodd, adeg mewn rhwng. And I think I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pass on to Gemma. So if you're ready, Gemma. Hi, thanks. That was beautiful, Bex. Thank you. Okay, bear with me one second. Hi, everybody. Just bear with one second from the beginning. Should work. Hopefully you can see that. Is that okay? Okay, so um, yeah, I'm not going to um, talk about all of the works, um, just to keep, look at a few key pieces and talk about uh, some of the relationships and enjoying the collaboration um, and things like that, which has already been spoken about. Um, so this first piece, Imagine Mountains, um, I hope you can all see but have you, do you have the double screens? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So this key, this is one of the key pieces, um, I think, because it's it was in Khan as well. Um, it's quite quite a large piece. Um, it's it's been quite, I would say, um, like an unknown piece in a way. So the way it was made, um, how I often work is through lots of sketches and observations of my, uh, of, of my, my surroundings, my landscapes, and that comes in with kind of uh, thoughts and this idea of the in-between, um, in-between states being where my painting practice is quite a um, personal um, kind of, um, a personal practice where where it doesn't involve much collaboration with others really and um, so uh, this this collaboration thing you know very unique for me um quite a unique experience um and so i was actually discussing the talk uh, some ideas about the themes with jenny and um i kind of we were talking about the walks that we'd had. So she'd done lots of walks in the woods and we were sharing these different stories of um, little interventions that we were trying. And I remembered a walk that I'd, that I'd often do. Um, we were kind of joking about how we would circle around. Um, so I live in Chester and there's like one bridge you can go across and you can go anti-clockwise or you can go across the other bridge first and go clockwise. And, and at certain points in Chester, you can actually see the Welsh mountains, um, Movama especially, um, and other points you can't. And I guess what, what was happening for me was I could, I, I had this realisation after speaking with Jenny that uh, telling her about these, this walk, I realised that those in-between states that I have with my painting, it, like through the process of painting, actually started to occur in my everyday, <laughs> my reality on these like government, um, you know, these these walks that we were allowed to take. Um, so um, I, I was on the bridge um, in uh, in Chester and it's a really horrible bridge full of uh, kind of car fumes and things. And you just want to get across there as quickly as possible. And I, I looked up and it was around the same, it's interesting Beck's talking about the golden hour. It's around that kind of, um, that, time of day when the sun's starting to set and the clouds were turning pink but for a moment I thought they that I could see the mountains it is where the 
um, the title Imagine Mountains comes from um, because it is just the right direction. Um, so you should be able to see the mountains, only you're, you're at the wrong level. So Chester's kind of in a dip. Um, and then I could just see um, these these clouds. So my mind was playing tricks on me and it's all getting a bit trippy. So um, I think some of the figures in, in this as well. So the way I try and build landscapes and these imagined spaces um, and populate them with these kind of semi-formed figures uh, was also coming out of these sketches that I was doing through I, when I was uh, going out to work, I'd be on the bus in the morning and just sketching people's uh, glances over, like, over their masks uh, or scarves. And um, um, so I just thought I'd throw that in there just to show uh, how I like I chop them up and rearrange them and stick them down again. And, and that forms part of this process of how to, um, you know, create these spaces um, and populate them. Uh, and this is, um, I put this in here because this was one of the original sketches at the start of our collaboration. And the reason I, I put it in was because it did feature in some of the Instagram posts. Um, and I think it does play a part in terms of when we talk about movement um, and colors and shapes, re re repetition of shapes. Um, but what I find interesting with this was it was a, um, sketch like my observations of um a pebble floor and um it's since i was using it uh to do like um iphone um so i sent it to the girls so it's on my iphone um and then i i, I was like coloring coloring it in on the iphone um and then i was um it became it what happens with a lot of my work is it will be horizontal and then vertical and then horizontal so there's these kind of plays with uh different spaces again um with the work um and that plays a part in this painting which is in the show um which interacts nicely between jenny and uh, rebecca's work um so again it was a starting point for having this uh, conversation with these uh, forms again um kind of much more abstract than the other piece i think um um, I think that's all I want to say about that one for now. So here it is in situ with uh, Jenny's work and on the left, uh, on, on the right, sorry, with Bex's work as well. Um, oh, this was really, this was really fun. So starting to talk about uh, the, the collaborations between uh, the works. Um, very different space to to the one in Khan. Um, it 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 really lent itself to have um, a lot of uh, you know kind of playful um, moments between us. And uh, it's the first time that I've met Najia actually. Um, and it had been like we've been working together for ages. I felt like we were so comfortable. It felt like we were actually. I, I said at one point, it, it doesn't feel like I own the work, um, which I often feel like if a painting is successful, it can stand on its own two feet and I don't need to talk about it. Um, but I just, I kind of knew instantly where this one needed to go. Um, and there were some works that I couldn't show because it felt like, I often talk about like um, they're being a bit too aggressive or um, it interrupts the space. It's not having a good conversation, like a naughty child or something like this. You know, it kind of needs to go and sit in the corner. And um, with with uh, these works, it I think Bex, you mentioned earlier about the the bright orange and being really strong and being concerned about our thoughts about that with our works. But um, I just I needed them to be together, like your works, and we I think we mentioned that together, like they they work so well. And again, you have that kind of vertical horizontal element as well. Um, and I think it brings out that, that element in my work too. Um, and then here's another, another shot there with um, like from a completely different level with um, right much lower down. I love that photo with, with Jenny's work. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just put this one in because it shows um, uh, Najia's video, which we were saying is like a big no-no if you're a curator. <laughs> so I feel like if we'd had, uh, you know, like um, this conversation around curation, 
it's like, oh, you know, you can't break the rules and have reflected glass opposite um, a video. Um, but again, it's, it makes so much sense for our work. It's almost like we're one um, entity and the works are, you know, relatives or something in a, a family or I don't know. I don't know how to <laughs> um, describe them, but um, and just more, more kind of relationships there. Um, and so I'm coming to the one where <clears throat> the, the space changes. So Elysium is really nice. We've got the two spaces, but then there's these little alcoves as well and points where it changes direction. Um, um, so you get completely different viewpoints. And I just really enjoyed uh, these viewpoints. And we discussed, we've moved the work around quite a bit, and we discussed how these um, these might interact. And um, I think I've got it here, yeah. So, so I do know quite a lot of painters that would absolutely hate <laughs> paintings to be covered up. But, you know, I'd like to make people work for it. If they want to see the work, they've got to move to the side, you know, get in, get in under the, the cloth and things, you know. Um, there's no ideal viewing perspective or you know height or anything uh, for me. Um, you know, one person's eye level is another person. You know, completely different to another person's eye level, that kind of thing. So um, yeah. So again, movement, um, shadows. I think you know. Again, I was sometimes when I'm making work, I don't always know what they mean. I am in that space where. I'm working quite loosely and not trying to push anything too much onto the painting. And um, it feels like a conversation between me and the painting. Um, but but then um, I, I kind of liked seeing these other these new conversations or relationships coming out in the work. So this started originally was was quite a solid object, whereas now with Nadia's work, it feels like shift. Like it is like shadow shifting, and you know it, it's. The, the title shift has a completely different meaning to me now for me now. Um, so yeah, so I, I like that. I have no problems with the, the meaning of my work changing like that. Um, oh, that's it. <laughs> I don't know if that was within time or yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>